Hey gang, Howler Mouse is having a contest. It runs until the end of March. He wants to know our top five comics. Here's Batman Year One. And yes, I've stressed this before, but the Catwoman storyline is supposed to be the comedy line. It's supposed to be funny that she knows how to use a whip because she's a dominatrix. It's supposed to be funny that Holly offers herself to a disguised paragon of morality like Bruce Wayne. It's supposed to be funny when Selina and Holly get shots in their butts for bat bites. It's supposed to be funny when Catwoman tears apart pop culture collectibles trying to find what's valuable in them. I'm sorry that the female character is comedy relief, and I know it's offensive. But if you can suppress your outrage, you'll find that this is a damn good book. Here's a kind of ratty copy of OMAC number one. This was technically the first Kirby comic that made me go, Oh my god! I know why people keep saying Kirby's a genius! I'd read a few Kirby comics when I was a kid, Battle for a Three-Dimensional World, which I hated, and Devil Dinosaur number one, which I got in a dollar box in some junk store, which I also hated. I just didn't give a care about Kirby. Well, in 1997, I bought a Forever People because I was obsessed with Sandman and Sandman had just ended and issue 5 had backups from the 40s Simon and Kirby Sandman. I didn't really read it. But then the same collection my dealer got the Forever People from had these ratty Omax, and he gave me the first issue for free. And I was blown away. It never comes out and says it, but these are freaky sex robots that you can just abuse and they're also used for assassinations. And the sort of creepy postmodernist parody of Captain America, I was like, my god, I love this. And then I finally read The Forever People and then got some commandies and the New Gods Baxter books and I was hooked. This is 8-Ball number 15, which has the story caricature. It's about a vapid, unsatisfied traveling caricaturist. And he runs into this girl at a fair. She claims that he's a genius. She claims many things, but none are necessarily true. He tells her about the caricaturist's trade over dinner how you want to make the most flattering drawing for a customer, and she encourages him to draw the way he really feels people look. He's compelled to do this, and it shatters his view of the life he's chosen. This is basically a story about the value of art and imbuing art with value. It's cruel and unusual, and doesn't even have the finesse of later Klaus stories, but I feel it has more power. It's like a Sleeping Beauty story, but we actually see the dream and how hollow it is. Some of the stuff is a little heavy-handed, like, it ends with him looking at his reflection in an unflushed toilet, but that bluntness sort of gives it a, a, a grim fairy tales type feel. Here's the untold legend of the Batman. During the Batman movie craze, there was Batman merch everywhere, and they did these undersized Baxter reprints, which were packaged in hard plastic with a cassette tape that had a performance of the story and a very catchy theme song. So I've had those since I was a lad. There used to be a copy of this little paperback book in my grade 4 class, which I read over and over again. And I got this copy a couple of years ago for a buck at a thrift store. And I just got the regular issues in a wad of Dead Guys stuff that my dealer gave me. It's only the first two issues. In theory, this is meant to cover Batman's modern pre-crisis career. It's various characters' memories of, like, the Batmobile and the villain's origins and such. But it's actually a story about Batman trying to kill himself. And that's not me reading into it. Someone's trying to kill Batman, knows all of his secrets. It ends up that it's the ghost of Bruce Wayne because Bruce thinks he isn't allowed to live. It's pretty goddamn entertaining. And finally, the Forever People, specifically issue 11, but I've lost track of where I put that since the last video I featured it in. But issue 11 has a bounty hunter named Devil Lance. He's this phallic abusive father figure. And Mother Box is trying to protect the kids. He attacks them at their apartment, which is the Ego. Mother Box teleports them to an underground cave, which is the Id. She then takes them to an island with a bunch of Easter Island-style grimstone faces. This represents the Super Ego. The faces represent the criticism you have to absorb and solidify in your own makeup. It's mostly criticism from your father figure. And Kirby drives this home to the reader, because when Devil Lance lands, the first thing Seraphan does is toss a cosmic cartridge at him, and it turns him into stone. Why didn't he do that at the apartment? Why didn't he do that at the cave? Because Kirby wants to drive the meaning home. But to accept the father, you have to reject the mother, and they can't do that. Infinity Man battles Devil Lance, and they destroy the island. They destroy the possibilities for critical thinking. And the kids end up in this warm, wet paradise where the narration says that they turn their backs on Earth. They turn their backs on the life they built, on reality, to be alone with Mother. This and the movie Crumb are great examples of the Oedipal conspiracy. So thank you to Howler Mouse. Thank you for this contest. 
Thank you all for using my videos like NyQuil, using them to drift off to sleep as they play. Because YouTube doesn't know the difference of views of you to them.